From downtown Detroit, Local 4 News at 5 starts now. Like a scene out of a movie, a suspect weaving his way through traffic in and out of cars, and then he was shot by police. You'll hear from witnesses how it all went down. Also, welcome to summer. Near 90 degrees in the middle of May, but better not get used to it just yet. But first, a woman knocked out behind the wheel after a chunk of concrete goes flying through her windshield, and this isn't the first time it's happened there. Thanks for being with us for the news at 5 o'clock. That was the horror a Gross Point woman experienced this morning because of Michigan's crumbling roads. Look at this damage. You see the hole right there, right at the driver's side of the windshield. This is a large chunk of concrete that came through and made that hole, oh. lifted up from the road and causing the damage. Local 4 has learned this was not the first frightening incident of its kind in that very spot of I-696 at Hoover within the past week. We bring in Rod Maloney, who is live in Warren with more on what's happened here. Rod, awful. Yeah, well, here's the thing. Uh, sadly, the woman who was in this accident this morning is still in the hospital and has been downgraded now to critical condition. State police are asking for people's prayers. They don't often do that, but it's clear by watching what happened here that this woman is lucky to be alive. 8.30 a.m. westbound and I-696 at Hoover, a football-sized piece of highway weighing at least 10 to 12 pounds gets jarred loose, flies up and into the windshield of this Buick Enclave. The 42-year-old Gross Point woman behind the wheel gets hit squarely in the face and is knocked unconscious. Her car slams into a Pontiac Grand Prix driving next to her. They both careen into the wall. The airbags deployed and the bleeding woman came to as EMS techs helped put her into an ambulance to send her to nearby St. John's Hospital. And while we didn't hear about it then, exactly a week ago at the same time on the same stretch of I-96, Nick Shade of Chesterfield says he experienced almost the same fate. It happens in the blink of an eye and then before I knew it, glass was everywhere. His car, which is still in the shop, had new window tinting on it, and he thinks that may have prevented the rock from hitting him in the face, but the rock did fall through and land on his dash, disorienting, to say the least. Everything hitting you and not knowing what's hitting you all at once, and um, yeah, it's very scary. And MSP says it's giving the Michigan Department of Transportation the chunk of highway from this morning's accident. God, I'm just praying that she's okay and um, thought wise beyond everything that, you know, Michigan wise roads and everything like that, they're horrible. We need to do something about them. Now, the road was closed down for almost an hour and a half. The Macomb County Road Commission came out and put cold patch in the hole that was created by that piece of highway breaking off. In the meantime, Michigan State Police say they're going to be taking that football sized chunk of highway and giving it to MDOT. To take a look at back to you. Well, in fact, Rod, have we had any comment from MDOT about what's happened? Yeah, we reached out to them and they said a couple of things. One, this stretch of highway they say is 50 years old and depending on funding, they expect to be rebuilding it in about uh, two or three years. But they also pointed us to the governor's report on infrastructure and how important it is to make Michigan's infrastructure better to improve everybody's life. Yeah. All right, Rod. Uh, horrible to hear that uh, she's in worse condition than she was when they, she first got to the hospital. We will continue to follow that story. Meanwhile, we've also got breaking news that we're following at this hour concerning children impacted by the Flint water crisis. Some of them will have to be rechecked for lead because of faulty testing. This is according to the CDC. Some tests were not administered properly, and as a result, they showed falsely low levels of lead in the blood. Doctors say less than 2% of blood tests done in Michigan are affected, but kids who are younger than six who have had a lead test since 2014 are going to need to see their doctors for possible retesting. A shootout with police in the middle of East Jefferson today just before noon with innocent people caught in the crossfire. Luckily, the only person who was shot was a suspect who police say had a gun. Jason Colthorpe is there live this evening with more. Jason. And boy, it could have been a lot worse, Kim. I mean, just take a look at Jefferson. Imagine someone out here in the middle of it running. And the suspect at one point started at the mobile gas station, ended up at the Detroit Regency. By the time police called, he's on the run, weaving his way through traffic by all these businesses. And as you can imagine, it was chaos. A wild scene on Jefferson playing out in broad daylight, which began with a man acting erratically near the Detroit Regency Hotel, and he was armed with a gun. 
Witnesses and Chief James Craig describe what happened next. So at some point he leaves the hotel, uh, kind of running away from the officers, but in doing so, he runs out into traffic here on Jefferson. And he was running in, down the sidewalk, in and out the cars, and they were chasing him, and he was yelling, and they were yelling, and then he jumped over a few cars, he whipped around a few of the police officers, he was juking them like he was a football player or something. He had his hand in his pocket, and then he pulled out a gun. And the next, you know, we started hearing gunshots, and that's when uh, the perpetrator was uh, basically, he was put down. He turns and faces the officer. We now know he pops and fired as many as three shots at the officers from a nine millimeter handgun. Certainly the officers, both fearing for their life, uh, returned fire. He was going to kill somebody. It was definite. Police say the 31 year old man has a lengthy rap sheet and was paroled in 2014 and had just had a run in with police last month. The subject was arrested, we believe, uh, by officers assigned to the 5th precinct on a narcotics violation. Ironically, uh, he resisted during that encounter. Now again, traffic wasn't uh, as busy as it is during rush hour, but you can see how busy Jefferson is right now. And imagine uh, just all the people caught in the middle of this. In fact, Chief Craig saying one car that was not involved in any of this was hit by gunfire. So in his words, this could have been a lot worse. Reporting just yeah. as of downtown, Jason Coulter, Local 4. Indeed, so much worse, Jason. So the suspect, do we know how he's doing? Is he expected to survive? Right now, they think they are non-life threatening injuries. They confirm he was shot twice, but right now they say it could have been three times. They don't know that yet, but obviously right now, no charges. It's a very fresh investigation. Yeah. They're going to see where things stand tomorrow, yep. Kim. All right, keep us posted, Jason. Thank you. Maybe the middle of May. Not maybe, it is. Uh, but it feels like it's mid-August today, doesn't it? It does. Close to 90 degrees out there. Andrew's in for Ben tonight. Andrew, uh, do we have more of this on tap for tomorrow? We have more 80s coming back for tomorrow, but with a bit of a change. First, let's get to the temperatures now. If you recall, first at 4, we had 88 degrees. Now it's 86 degrees, down by 2, but still feeling like summer out there, and the humidity still with us. 85 currently for our friends in Monroe, while it's 84 in Pontiac, 85 degrees for our friends over in Mount Clemens. Now it remains dry tonight, but look at it's big circulation in the atmosphere. Showers and thunderstorms from Nebraska to Iowa, parts of Minnesota. We don't need to worry about showers or storms until late tomorrow. This evening, for baseball and everything else, it remains dry. 86 degrees now, and we're looking at warm and muggy conditions overnight. We'll talk more about the timing of those storms for tomorrow, as well as temperatures afterward into your weekend, coming right up. very much. Detroit police are working to find out what led to a 33 year old man being shot to death in a barrage of gunfire. Shooting happened at 3 a.m. outside Bob's Lounge on Chester Street near Harper Avenue. A witness says he was leaving the lounge with two others when he saw the victim, Christopher Marcellus, get into an argument. A gunman ordered them back inside the bar and once back in, they heard gunshots. The victim's family says he was at the lounge getting food. Sometimes he haven't been here in a while, but sometimes he hang out, but not like all the time because it's been real dangerous out here. So he don't really hang out no more. He was up here getting some food. Marcellus's family says he wasn't having problems with anyone and that his murder is out of the blue. Police have not released any descriptions of the suspect. All right, we continue to follow that breaking news we first told you about at four o'clock uh, from Wall Street, where U.S. stocks saw a big sell off and volatility mounts due to political turmoil. That turmoil casting doubt as to whether President Trump can push forward with a pro-growth agenda that had helped drive stocks to repeat records in the first place. The Dow Jones Industrial Average you see there, uh, it's down some 372 points. The, the NASDAQ down 158 points. Uh, it recorded its worst day this year. Devin? Well, did President Trump try to urge the FBI director to drop an investigation? That is the big question in Washington tonight after a February memo written by the former director, James Comey, has now come to light. And in it, Comey writes, the president asked him to drop a probe into former National Security Advisor Michael Flynn. The White House says it's absolutely not true. Blaine Alexander is at the White House tonight with more. Blaine. Well, Devin, the White House says that President Trump has never asked Comey or anyone else to end an investigation, and today the president himself pushed back. <laughs> president Trump offering some career advice to the Coast Guard Academy's class of 2017. Over the course of your life, you will find that things are not always fair. Thoughts from a commander-in-chief under fire. 
Look at the way I've been treated lately. You can't let them get you down. A cheering crowd of cadets, a stark contrast to the scene back in Washington. Facts. We need facts. Capitol Hill in an uproar over reports that President Trump asked FBI Director James Comey back in February to stop an investigation into Michael Flynn, fired for lying about his ties to Russia. And there's clearly a lot of po politics being played. Our job is to get the facts and to be sober about doing that. Speaker Paul Ryan still backing the president, but elsewhere, signs of wavering GOP support. Lisa Murkowski becoming the first Republican senator to consider a special prosecutor. GOP uh, Congressman Adam Kinzinger now expressing his doubts. But I do think we need a fresh set of independent eyes to figure out what happened. Democrats working to get Comey's testimony on the record. I have a high level of expect, high expectation that he will appear President Trump today sounding defiant. You have to put your head down and fight, fight, fight. A message to graduates and the president's own critics. And today, House Oversight Committee Chair Jason Chaffetz tweeted that he wants Comey to testify at a hearing next Wednesday. At the White House, Blaine Alexander, Local 4. All right, Blaine. Safe to say a rookie officer in Northville Township had a rather eventful first day. Indeed, new tonight, how he helped save the day on the very first emergency call of his career. And now it is official. New here at 5, Ford confirms they are cutting their workforce. We'll tell you where those cuts are coming just ahead. Karen? It's their place of worship to sing and gather as a community. But these church members worry about their neighbor next door. It's dangerous. It's very dangerous. They call the local four defenders for help. So why is this building still standing? The story next. Tonight. New at six. Finally, a victory for the Macomb County clerk, but it only lasted 30 steps. We'll tell you who was waiting for her in the hallway. Okay, Jason, plus drugs in the neighborhoods. One woman finding needles and even taking this picture of a heroin user passed out on her sidewalk. New at 6, we'll show you where it's happening and what neighbors are doing to try to keep kids away from it. Church members united in prayer and concern for their neighbor next door. The building is, is dangerous. Uh, you know, you, you don't know what's in there. You don't know what's going in there. Yeah, members of this Detroit church are frustrated. Yeah, they are, and they say the building next to them is a big problem, and they don't understand why it's still standing. That's why they called Local 4 Defender Karen Drew, who went looking for answers. Church is supposed to be a safe place for you and your family, but the folks here at New Order Missionary Baptist Church are really worried about this eyesore, and they want something done about it. Inside New Order Missionary Baptist Church in Detroit, everyone is joyful, singing and praising God during Sunday service. It's just a mess, and uh, it's dangerous. It's very dangerous. Outside, joy turns to worry about the building next door. It's a hazardous place where uh, crime and, uh, you know, drugs, and I think it need to be torn down. It makes me feel bad, awful. I mean, it's, and because I am a, a administrator here, you know, it, 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 I feel somewhat responsible if anything should happen over there. Broken windows, graffiti, trash dumped all around. Nothing good is happening in and around this building next to the church. We have kids, you know, they can run it out of here out of the church and, you know, and who knows, someone could be standing in there waiting for somebody to come out there and snatch them out. So. Deacon Moses McNeil says they were told the city would tear down the building, but here it stands. That's why they call the local four defenders. We just wanted to see if we can get uh, you guys to shine a light on it. We pulled court documents and discovered the city sued the property owner, Paris McCurdy, and the building was declared a public nuisance last May. McCurdy had 10 days to clean up the property or the city would be, quote, entitled to immediately proceed with the demolition. The owner didn't take responsibility, so why didn't the city tear it down? It's been a year of waiting. The city issued a statement to the defenders in part reading, this property is in the pipeline for demo, but not yet contracted. That will take place after all of the environmental assessments have been conducted. 
And those environmental tests are important because with older commercial buildings, ground and other forms of contamination are frequently found. Now we did ask when those tests would be complete. The Detroit Building Authority hopes to have them done by the end of the year, targeting demolition for next spring. Of course, we'll stay on top of this for you. Members of the church are very happy to hear the building will be coming down. Yeah. I'm sure they are ecstatic. It is great. I'd like you both to stay here for just a moment. Huh, why would that be, Devin? <laughs> Notice anything? No. Unusual? What? You two are adorable. <laughs> How did well, you pull this off? This is very <laughs> funny because we were in the newsroom and I heard this loud scream. I just saw Karen. I saw <laughs> she went very loud. So and I ran to ask the boss, what do we do? Should I go home? Well, we've been in this situation. We have a couple similar dresses. And many times I'll text this you one. like, yeah. hey, I'm doing yeah. this. I knew you had this dress and I should have te texted you. I saw you. you wore pink yesterday. So I'm like, there's I no know, way I she's going to wear this. Pink and purple, right? I and you know what would be a great so story we were saying? Like, if this would have been like a fancy dress. Oh, I mean, yeah. we got it's this a, off like the discount one. rack at Macy's. Even better. Even better. Wouldn't it be cool if it was fancy? Same designer, same designer <laughs> in Italy. You can yeah, find yeah, this. Exactly. Like, no, I'd be like, you can find this three years ago, probably. <laughs> it's not the even sale there. rack at Macy's is where so, we got this. So, uh, at Twitter now, hashtag who wore it better. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, we're not competing. Uh -uh. No way. Just kidding. You both look spectacular. Well, thank you. Better than me. You and you you did a purple tie. Exactly. At least you played along. <laughs> so what go. do we got coming on a very warm day? <laughs> well, we got some <laughs> very summer-like weather. Both yep. going sleeveless. Sleeveless. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So there you go. Happy to help out, ladies. <laughs> All right, we have temperatures tonight that will be down to near 70 degrees. Take a look at your forecast. All this yellow that you see right here, not purple, it indicates how warm it's going to be overnight. Down to only about 70 or 72 in the metro zone. Same thing south of 94. Get those air conditioners ready from Luna Pier all the way over into Lenaway County as well. Blissfield, Adrian around 70 or 71. West of 275, same deal, 69 to 71 degrees. Western Oakland County and the Livingston County in Ann Arbor. And north of Hall Road, yeah, it's warm where you are too. Warm and muggy overnight, a bit breezy with uh, temperatures down to around 68 degrees in Lexington. Out there right now, looking fantastic. Yes, you'll want to go sleeveless too for the evening. We're looking at 86 degrees currently. Pretty strong wind out of the southwest around 24 miles per hour. And look at how temperatures go over the next seven days. Now keep in mind, the average high this time of year is 70 degrees. That's the low we'll see tonight. High temperatures over the next seven get closer to average or below as we go into Friday and Saturday. Tomorrow, another very warm hot, if you will, and humid day with 84 degrees currently right now for our friends in Pontiac. We've got 86 over in Livonia, 84 for our friends in Ann Arbor. It is hot, not just here in Detroit, but all over Southeast Michigan. Many of these temps as much as 12 degrees above what they were just 24 hours ago. Breezy in your neighborhood too. Winds sustained around 15 to 25 miles per hour. Gusts over 30 miles per hour. So hold on to your hats. If tonight is trash night, make sure those items are secure by tomorrow morning because it does remain windy. Now there is a slight to marginal chance, very low chance of strong to severe weather tomorrow. That's because we have a cold front on the way. It's going to bring a couple of changes. First, after it's hot and humid tomorrow afternoon, this cold front gets closer. 4 p.m. and afterward, we'll see some showers and thunderstorms start to erupt. There's only a marginal to slight chance of them being strong to severe, so keep it tuned right here to Local 4. Also, the Local Forecasters Act app, you can track them. So that's one change, the storms that erupt. After that, cooler and less humid as we go into Friday and Saturday, feeling more like May instead of July and August. So overnight tonight, no showers or thunderstorms at all. The baseball game is safe. Your dinner plans are safe. Whatever you have planned for late night tonight, that's safe too. Temperatures down to 70 degrees overnight, so make sure your home is well ventilated and make sure those air conditioners are working. 87 tomorrow. Temperatures just about as high as today. So far, we've made it up to around 88 or 89 degrees over at Metro. But a chance of scattered storms at first around 4 p.m., maybe more widespread showers and storms by dinner time tomorrow and afterward. Then as we go into Friday and Saturday, look at that sunshine coming back for the beginning of the weekend. 64 degrees on Friday, 70 on Saturday. Another chance of showers and storms possible Sunday into Monday, but nowhere near the 80s after yeah. tomorrow. Just this little stretch, though. Been nice today. Nice yeah. indeed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hi there, Doc. Hey, guys. Can music help make a difference for people suffering from Alzheimer's? Well, ahead in good health, how a familiar tune could help make communication easier. But first, the female genital mutilation case has lawmakers in Lansing taking action. We'll tell you about it next. 
The state Senate toughens the penalty for female genital mutilation. Doctors or other individuals who perform the procedure on young girls in Michigan could face up to 15 years in prison under legislation that was unanimously approved. The bills would toughen a five-year penal federal penalty. Uh, this is all happening roughly one month after two suburban Detroit doctors and a spouse were criminally charged for allegedly cutting seven-year-old girls and conspiring to cover up the crime. It was the first federal indictment of its kind in the country. Ford Motor Company has released details on their plans to cut their global workforce. The company confirms it's going to cut 10% of its salary jobs in North America and Asia Pacific this year, all in an effort to boost profit. The company says it's going to offer voluntary early retirement and separation packages to its workers. It expects 1,400 positions to be eliminated by the end of September. We will learn more, we expect, sometime in June. New at 5.30. Up in flames, a Michigan motel completely destroyed by fire, a number of people injured, some of them children. Tornado outbreak, a path of destruction from Oklahoma to Minnesota, and the threat is far from over. It was an officer's first day on the job, his first call for help, and he helps save a life. Tonight, he's sharing his story with us. It's dinner time. Live from downtown Detroit, Local 4 News at 5.30 starts now. What a start. A rookie officer in Northville helped save a life on the first emergency call of his career. When Officer Tyler Schmidt, who began his first shift as a Northville Township police officer, he had no idea what would happen out on the streets. But when that first call came in, he knew just what to do and ended up saving a life. We bring in Sean Lay. Uh, you could say he's batting a thousand so far, Sean. Batting a thousand right now. Let's say it again. First day on the job, very first call for an emergency, and it was a matter of life and death. Northville Township Officer Tyler Schmitto, he's 23 years old, graduated from the police academy this month, and how many days on the force? Two. His first night on the job was Monday. His very first call was for a man in full cardiac arrest. Um, my dad just passed out on the floor. A call to 911. A daughter says her 62 year old dad is down and not breathing. Does anyone there know how to do CPR? No. As the dispatcher talked the daughter and the man's wife through giving chest compressions, Officer Schmitto, just starting his first shift, got the call. Crazy that that would be the first one I go to, but like, like yeah, as, as you know, there's you never know what's going to happen. Schmitto was part of a team effort. Officers took over giving chest compressions. It was Schmitto's job to get the AED ready to shock the man. Remove clothes from patient's chest. I think it's something I will always remember, obviously, being that it's my first run, but also that it had such a great result. And I hope to have many more results like this. And that result, the man is making a full recovery. And in Schmitto's vehicle, that AED, it was donated by Firehouse Subs. A real example of a local small business that gave back to their community and had a direct impact on the residents of that community. Lucky that we got there in time to save his life because, you know, like I said, it's a great feeling. Officer Mr. Schmitto tells me you never forget your first call. He certainly won't forget this one. Couple of things, guys. Everyone here, fire department, police, the officer, the family, doing such a great job to save this man's life. The dispatcher was amazing in talking the family through those chest compressions. The other thing worth pointing out, Devin, this guy, the officer, he's 23 years old. I've got dress shirts that are 23 years old. <laughs> exactly. Well, now that he's uh, got two whole days under his belt, anything else uh, happened or is this, this pretty much the sum of it? Day two, suspect banging on windows and doors of a home. Oh. He and his training officer made an arrest as wow. well. How about that? It's been busy. All right, Sean. Karen. Well, at least three people are dead, dozens injured after a string of tornadoes along with hail and heavy rains swept across five states. Jay Gray explains how forecasters are warning that more severe weather could be on the way. That's it right there. That's literally the tornado. The attack from Mother Nature was intense. We've got a significant tornado on the ground. The damage widespread. As many as 27 tornadoes battering communities from the Texas Plains through Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska, and Wisconsin, where this morning stunned survivors are still trying to come to grips with the devastation left behind. Every place is just kind of bad. The worst, this mobile home park in Chatech. There were several trailers uh, here that are gone and, and, and not here anymore. 
Residents in Elk City, Oklahoma understand that loss. Their town took a direct hit. Trees ripped from the ground, homes ripped apart. Rocky Andreessen and his family rushed to their storm shelter as the twister wrecked their community. Well, we did a little bit of praying. Just held on to each other. It was, it, was, it was loud. 20 minutes later, the violent sounds of the storm replaced by an eerie silence and miles of debris. In other areas, it wasn't the wind, but hail and heavy rains that caused the biggest problem. And forecasters warn more severe weather could target the region for the next several days. Jay Gray, Local 4. Tonight, another system is expected to bring strong thunderstorms into southeastern Minnesota and western portions of central and southern Wisconsin. North Carolina Senator Tom Tillis says he's okay after collapsing during a charity race. You are looking at a video that he posted to his Twitter account explaining exactly what happened. Tillis says he and his team were running in the American Council of Life Insurers Capital Challenge when he got overheated. Now, he did not need CPR and was taken to the hospital as a precaution. U.S. soldier Chelsea Manning is a free woman tonight. Uh, served seven years for illegally leaking thousands of diplomatic cables and military files to WikiLeaks. A U.S. Army spokesperson confirmed that she left Fort Leavenworth Military Prison in Kansas this morning. The controversial decision to release Manning early from a 35-year sentence was one of President Obama's final acts of his presidency. Back here at home, a new community of luxury homes unveiled today in Detroit after nine years of construction. The Morgan Waterfront Estates are a new batch of mansions, uh, but also homes, condos, all located on Detroit's east side on the waterfront. Construction actually broke ground nine years ago. It stalled during the recession. Condo, but now back open and running. Condo prices started at about $200,000. The homes go all the way up to two and a half million dollars. Today is a railroad crossing enforcement day. Police across the country are out today patrolling at railroad crossings in an effort to promote safe driving and also remind drivers of the dangers of distracted driving and the importance of using extra caution at railroad crossings. There were 133 accidents at railroad crossings last year. 19 were deadly. Stopping when the gates are lowered, not driving around them. Um, if there's no gates and the lights are flashing, stopping, or no closer than 15 feet, no further away than 50 feet away from the nearest rail. Police say all accidents can be avoided just by obeying the warning signs at railroads. Across Michigan this Wednesday evening, stories from up north in Gaylord and Saginaw. Well, let's start this roundup in the small town of Manton, which is where a fire destroyed a motel and sent three people to the hospital. Fire started about 4 o'clock this morning at the Green Mill Motel. When firefighters arrived, they found a woman and two children laying in the grass. All three had burns. They all had to be flown to a hospital in Grand Rapids. Fire investigators believe that the fire started in one of the rooms near the uh, motel office. In Saginaw Township, a man is in jail tonight after police say he robbed a doctor's office and crashed his SUV into a utility pole. This is 45-year-old Tyson Brown. He was charged yesterday for breaking and entering and for leading police on a chase. Investigators say he broke into a medical office and stole two laptop computers before leading officers on that chase. Eventually, he crashed his SUV and tried to make a run for it. He was taken into custody after officers tackled him. Well, you know, if you're a fan of the show, a Michigan native has advanced all the way to the finale of The Voice. Lauren Dusky from Gaylord has been named as one of the top four singers and now head of the next week's showdown that will decide the champion. She now lives in Nashville, but grew up in Gaylord, graduated from U of M. Uh, you can see how she does right here on Local 4. Part 1 airs Monday night at 8 p.m., and then the champion will be crowned Tuesday night at 9 p.m. Go get them and go blue. Yeah, solid voice. Yeah, she's, she's terrific. Uh, in good health now, music is considered a universal language and, of course, has the power to conjure uh, all kinds of long-forgotten moods mm. and memories the way a song just takes you it right really back. It really does take you back in time, so it's no wonder that it's proving to be a form of communication for patients who have Alzheimer's. Dr. McGeorge is here with more on this connection. Well, Karen and Devin, you know, when people deme with dementia progress, the victims often seem like they're slipping into an increasingly isolated world, and connecting with them becomes much more difficult. So any tool that can conjure a smile, a movement, or a knowing expression is really helpful. In sickness and in health. You were challenged on the sickness part. So I, I'm, I'm still not as bad off as a lot of people. 
I'm blessed. John and Judy have been married for 50 years. She would do the same for me. What John does is dedicate his life to make sure Judy's not alone. He visits her several times a day and plays her music, trying to comfort her with familiarity, something Alzheimer's stole from them a long time ago. She remembers it. To what extent, I don't know. Memory care director Mary Sparks says the part of your brain that remembers music is still responsive despite the disease, and therefore they can keep patients engaged with songs. There are two things that are not affected by dementia, music and our knowledge of God. I mean, we remember that song, but uh, I'm not sure if she was running around the house singing it while I was at work or anything. <laughs> It's subtle, a smile, a look, but whatever Judy is remembering helps the man who loves her most know she's still here. It'll bring the smile to her face. She could be sleeping, dozing in the chair, and when they put the earphones on her, you know, you can see that she's starting to light up. Now, even though we don't know if the music is reawakening a specific memory, it is still very helpful because it can shift moods, manage stress, and really stimulate positive interactions, which can be very difficult when a person becomes more demented. It is so complicated when you're trying to test their responses, though, right. trying to connect them to something and really understanding what it is you're seeing. Well, that's exactly it. You can't exactly tell what it is they're responding to specifically, yeah. but you do know that there is a response, there's some awakening, and that by itself is really a huge yeah, comfort yeah. to most family yeah, members. I'm sure it is. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Doc. Well, a bizarre crime in Arizona has pretty much stumped investigators. New tonight, a car slams into a store, but it's what the driver didn't do that makes this so bizarre. Hank. They're expected to be the Hot Destinations Memorial Day weekend, where you can take a quick trip and also save a little bit of money. It's coming up in my Help Me Hank report. All right, but first, police say it was a completely random attack. Brand new information tonight after a security guard is sucker punched on camera. That's next. Coming up Thursday morning, only on Local 4 News Today, we're talking spring cleaning for your car. I'll show you cheap and effective ways to eliminate the grime inside and out. That's for Thrifty Thursday at 5.50. Hank? Summer steals and deals, the vacation bargains you need to know about before you book your family trip. A Help Me Hank special report tomorrow starting at 6 a.m. Plus, as always, you've got your weather and traffic on the fours. Detroit mornings start here from 4.30 to 7 a.m. See you in the morning. I teach.